A bomb has exploded in London. A number of people are hurt and have been rushed to hospital. He wanted people to, to associate him as being a mass murderer. Who the hell is this person? He's gone from blacks to Asians to gays. I don't feel sadness or sorrow. I don't feel joy about killing anyone. I just had to do it. It's my destiny. This is the story of two terrifying weeks in London, when a lone bomber held the city in the grip of terror. No one knew where he'd strike next, or why. Hundreds were maimed, three people were killed. The police manhunt faced an enormous challenge. Who, among London's millions, was behind the carnage? How could they nail the nail bomber? and save lives. This is the gripping story of their race against time. It's a story of high-tech surveillance and brilliant policing. And it begins in April 1999 in a busy London market. Started off all right that day, like it was, it was busy, and all through the afternoon, and it was coming up to packing up time, and everyone just wanted to get home. I was serving up customers fruit and veg, and when I got told that there was a bag underneath the stool, I had a look into it, and it was like a sandwich box with another little sandwich box on top and it was sellotaped together, and in the top box it had a clock with wires going into the bottom box. And then it was going, clicking, like, ticking. When I looked here, I thought, that's just like someone's made it up. It may have looked improbable, but the mystery package was now generating confusion and concern. A security guard come running into the, to the entrance of the store, and to me, seemed to be running around in circles, shouting out, there's a bomb outside. It had been three years since London's last terrorist bomb. People's defences were down. I walked up to, to show a police from where it was, and uh, that's when it went off. It was a big bang, and windows on Iceland went psh, it's all shattering, and, and everyone's screaming, and a big cloud of smoke just went up in the air, like, and it was really bad. Emergency services arrived on a scene more like Beirut than Brixton. When I looked down, and and I see the nail in my foot, I just pulled, I pulled the nail out and like, I hold it onto the nail in my hands and I was in shock then. I got hit with eight nails. I got one in my head here. I got one lodged under my arm here. I got one in my bottom. I got three down my legs and I got one at the end of my penis. Nine of the 49 victims needed surgery. They included a two-year-old boy with a nail lodged in his skull. Whoever had done this had intended to kill. Under Detective Chief Inspector Maureen Boyle, the Met Police's anti-terrorist branch, SO13, was put in immediate charge of the investigation. I was briefed that there'd been an explosion caused by a bomb in, in Brixton it had gone off around about half past five uh, that evening and that we knew that it was a bomb and that the damage had been extensive and many, many people had been injured. 
most of the damage had been caused by, in actual fact, flying nails because the, the bomb had actually contained a significant number of nails. And they had actually exploded and fired almost like bullets, causing damage. Worryingly, there were more questions than answers. No warnings, no apparent motive, no claims of responsibility. And yet, an attack perfectly calculated to breed terror. When this bomb exploded, we had absolutely no idea who could be responsible for it, or indeed, what motives. It wasn't what you would consider to be a natural target for potentially international or even Irish terrorism. So I was quite surprised, bewildered by what it could be. In the 30-year war against terror on London streets, there'd been nothing quite like this before. No calls, no claims, no suspects. For Maureen Boyle and her team, the bomber's silence sent worrying signals. It is unusual to have uh, no intelligence in relation to a bomb. Our experience very much based around Irish terrorism and had different factors involved. There was usually uh, or often a warning given by the IRA in relation to where a that a bomb had been planted. And if one bomb could be planted without warning, then so could a second. But when, where, and who was doing this to London? The bomb in Brixton had ripped through a busy London market. No one had been killed, but the hundreds of nails had caused appalling injuries. An immediate police manhunt was launched, codename Operation Marathon. Well, we had no prime suspects. Uh, we were absolutely open-minded as to who could have been responsible and indeed the motivation. However, the style of the bomb and the location seemed to eliminate one potential set of suspects. What we were able to do uh, fairly early was to actually eliminate the, the Irish terrorism link. This was not a device that was in any way similar to the type of devices that Irish terrorism had used. With one obvious prime suspect ruled out, the manhunt turned to numerous terrifying alternatives. We considered uh, all different options as to what the motivation could be. It could have even been a local dispute between the, the market traders. We even considered a local dispute between drug dealers. Also at that time, the, the war in Kosovo uh, was very much at the front of the media and the news. It could have been related to that. But one theory made more sense than the many others. I was talking to other crime journalists who were ringing around their own contacts. So we were talking and saying, what, are you, what feedback are you getting? People were saying, it's got to be a race, racial attack. There's no other possible conclusion that you can draw. Jerry Gable, who monitors the UK's extreme right, also believed the bombing was racially motivated. Then our concern was to try and work out which group or which individual might be responsible for this. 36 hours after the explosion, the police were contacted. The caller claimed responsibility in the name of the extreme right group, Combat 18. But the call was a hoax. We just felt quite solidly that if the bombings were being carried out by people inside C-18, either of the factions, we would have heard something and we were hearing nothing. We had our people inside and we also turned some of their people and hardly anything was going on within that organisation that we weren't getting some prior knowledge of, or knowledge immediately after the activity. Three days after the blast, and the police still hadn't made a breakthrough. Back at the crime scene, however, 
Painstaking forensics was unearthing clues. Hidden amongst the shattered metal and glass, experts were pinpointing the chemical profile of the nail bomber. What we actually want to do is to recover all the component parts that actually came from the device to give us a better picture and to inform us as to what kind of device had been used and how that had been made up and also to give us the opportunity forensically of obtaining either fingerprints or DNA. The findings from the debris and, and the chemistry and um, the materials that were subsequently recovered um, identified it as being um, a relatively small, uh, unsophisticated explosive. It was different to the sort of explosives that have been largely seen in terrorist type incidents in the past, which tend to be with things like Semtex. It was uh, an inorganic explosive, the type of things that you would find in, say, fireworks. It was a start, but it still wasn't enough. There was no way from which you could attribute it to a particular group. The materials recovered hadn't been seen before and couldn't be linked into anything in the databases. You probably wouldn't need explosives expertise to produce the bomb, particularly if somebody were to be working from a recipe or a cookbook. Other clues had been found in Brixton. Now one of them would prove crucial. The bomb had arrived and been contained within a black sports holdall which had the green writing of head on the side of the bag and that indeed the bag had actually been placed beside the bus stop on the main Brixton Road outside the Iceland store. But the bag had not been destroyed. After the bomber put it down, market traders had moved it, dumping it on top of some pallets beside the Iceland food store. Astonishingly, an unknown person had removed the contents, not knowing it was a bomb, and then stolen the bag. After the blast, the police had recovered this key clue. It was clean of DNA or fingerprints, but the distinctive head bag would now prove vital. The fact that we recovered it, it actually gave us something to work on when it came to looking at the CCTV footage. It helped that Brixton had one of the UK's highest concentrations of CCTV cameras. Our initial priority was actually to gather all the CCTV footage from not only the immediate area, but the main intersections, public transport intersections within uh, the, the South East London area. Those videos actually contained in the region of 26,000 hours worth of viewing. So our officers actually had to look through all of that footage. On the Saturday afternoon, four, five o'clock in the afternoon at Brixton Market, it was very busy. And on the images that were recovered, all you could actually see was head and shoulders. So you couldn't physically see if someone was holding or carrying a bag by their side. So that made it very, very difficult. The images were also of poor quality. Most tapes had been reused for shop surveillance hundreds of times. They had to be viewed still by still to ensure that they actually could see with clarity what people were doing and what people were carrying. Meanwhile, the investigation was dogged by yet more bogus claims of responsibility. We had several calls from people purporting to be from extreme right-wing groups, uh, claiming association and indeed supporting the fact that the bomb had gone off. There was no intelligence or nothing to support that any of them were in actual fact responsible for the bomb. Six days after the blast, and the police still had no strong leads, and no one plausible claiming responsibility. I actually thought they would catch whoever did it, you know, very quickly. Only somebody who was 
almost you know, suicidally stupid, would go out to one of those areas with all the activity, the police activity, community activity around it, would go out there.